Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording has started. Cloud recording is good. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. And Sergeant Lugo, would you be able to start with your opening statement? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the New York City Council fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget hearing of the Committee on Aging. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Chin, we are ready to begin. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, and I thank you for joining us today uh, for the oversight hearing on the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget and 2021 preliminary mayor's management report. I also wanted to thank, uh, welcome to all the advocates and community members who's watching this live stream, and welcome back to Commissioner Cortez Vasquez of the Department of the Aging. We are also joined by uh, committee member, council member DS Jr. and other council member, uh, I guess will be joining shortly and we will announce them uh, when they join us. In today's uh, preliminary budget hearing, we will hear testimony from the Department for the Aging, also known as DIFTA, on its proposed $383.5 million budget for fiscal year 2022. We will also discuss DIFTA's operation and performance indicators from the 2021 Preliminary Mayor's Management Report or PMMR. Just over a year ago, we met for a similar preliminary budget hearing in city council chambers. Within a week, much of New York City was shut down, beginning a long descent into the depth of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we are lucky to have effective vaccine that are still being rolled out to seniors and the prospect of new federal relief totaling 12.5 billion to the state and 6 billion to the city. Despite these positive steps, senior centers have remained closed for in-person activities since March, 2020, even as amusement park made plans to reopen. The preliminary budget includes no new needs for new investment like technology, meals, or senior centers, nor does it reflect federal revenue from the December 2020 stimulus or the potential March 2021 stimulus. The new stimulus bill contains 1.4 billion in funding for older American Act programs. In the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget, senior center funding totals 173 million, which four short of 10 million of the administration's previous commitment to seniors. I would like to hear how diff the senior center budget support the cost of reopening center and how it has the resource to deal with the heightened nutrition, mental health and health needs of seniors post-COVID. I continue to believe, as I wrote to the department in October, that DIFTA should formally postpone its planned senior center RFP to deal with these programs and budget issues. With billions in new federal funding coming to New York, the administration must keep its promise to add the 10 million for senior center and rebid the system only once centers are open and have the necessary resource. Home deliver meal and get food at YC are also an important matter in today's hearing. Provider estimate that the need for home deliver 
per meal has grown by at least 20 to 30% during the pandemic. There are also 777 or more seniors who are eligible for DIFTA's home delivered meal, but are currently placed in the sanitation's get food program instead of DIFTA's provider. I look forward to hearing how DIFTA intends to ensure no senior goes without a healthy and nutritious meal and how much is budgeted to meet the actual need for home delivered meals moving forward. Turning to DIFTA's fiscal 2022 preliminary capital budget, there are no new capital appropriation in the next two years, which hampers the department's ability to plan for growth in the diverse New York senior population. This is important for the future of the system, given that the department's analysis show how 29 of the city's 59 community district needs senior center expansion. Despite these challenges, there is no doubt that the past year has shown how hard DIFTA staff, the nonprofit providers and seniors are working every day to stay healthy and connected. And I would like to thank the commissioner for her service throughout the pandemic. This is my final of eight budget as the chair of the Committee on Aging. And I look forward to working together with DIFTA to build on previous investment. By working together, I believe we can develop the senior services of the future as we emerge from this COVID-19 pandemic. Before we swear in the commissioner, I'd like to thank the committee staff for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Senior finance, financial analyst, Daniel Krupp, unit head, Dohini Sapora, committee counsel, Nusak Chaudhuri, uh, senior legislative policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, my director of legislation and budget, uh, Kana Irvine, and my legislative associate, Angela Seeger. Uh, we also have been joined uh, by council member Ayala. So I would like, now like to turn it over to our committee, senior legislative policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, who will review some of the procedural items relating to today's hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chen. I am Kalima Johnson, Senior Legislative Policy Analyst to the Aging Committee of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted. I will be calling on witnesses to testify in panels. So please listen for your name to be called. I will be announcing in advance who the next panel will be. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, while you will be placed on a panel, I will be calling individuals to testify one at a time. Council members who have questions for our particular panelists should use the Zoom raise hand function. You will be called on in the order in which your hands are raised after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please note that for the purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing for a second round of questioning. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please listen for that cue. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. At the end of the three minutes, please wrap up your comments so we can move to the next panelist. Please listen carefully and wait for the surgeon to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony as there is a slight delay. 
I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify and answer questions. Commissioner Lorraine Cortez Vasquez from the Department for the Aging and Jose Mercado, DEFTA Chief Financial Officer. I will first read the oath and after I will call on you to respond. Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Mr. Mercado, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, commissioner. Thank you, commissioner. You may begin when ready. Thank you so much. Um, I'm having technical difficulties, so I hope that I could make it through my testimony and through the questions and answers. Uh, good morning, good morning, uh, Chairwoman Chin, Chair Drum, and members of the Aging and Finance Committees. I was moved, uh, I was moved, Chairwoman uh, Chin, when you said this was your last budget hearing. This too will probably be my last budget hearing. So uh, this is this is an important one for both of us. Um, as you know, I'm Lorraine Cortez Vasquez. I'm the commissioner of the Department for the Aging. I joined, I'm joined this morning by Jose Mercado, our chief financial officers. I will do my best to answer all your questions. And, Ho and Jose is, is quite adept at providing the details that I always uh, am, I fail at. So he will provide all of the financial details. Uh, I thank you for this opportunity to discuss DIFTA's preliminary budget for fiscal year. Uh, 2022. In addition to working to eliminate ageism, which we continue, and I'm happy to announce that there'll be a campaign later on uh, in the next few weeks, uh, ensuring and ensuring the dignity and quality of life for older New Yorkers and providing high quality services and resources are DIFTA's top priorities. To support this important work, our FY22 preliminary budget projects $383.6 million in funding, of which $264.8 million is city funds, which includes an allocation of $173.4 million to support older adult centers, commonly known as senior centers, and $41.8 million for home delivered meals, and another uh, $38 million for case management with another 34.4 million in support of home care for homebound older adults who are not Medicaid eligible. 8 million for NORC programs and 8.1 million for caregiver services. In addition to supporting these services, the administration has invested heavily in responding to the continued pandemic. Through the support and advocacy of important stakeholders, many will, who will be testifying today, we are also, we have also advanced many of our efforts to hold, uh, to help older New Yorkers in the midst of this pandemic. These have been nine and a half months that none of us could have ever imagined at the last budget hearing. And the impact that that has had on services, on our providers, but most importantly on older adults and their families has been incredible uh, and unprecedented. Some notable successes, though, despite this pandemic, there has been opportunity and, um, and growth. Uh, some notable successes include a pivot to online services with 259 centers providing such services since March, 2020 to January, offering 87,000 sessions of virtual events. Many of them are exciting, creative and innovative and it has been able to keep older adults in touch. A collaboration with the New York City Housing Authority and the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Office, uh, we were able to provide 10,000 laptops along with a year of internet to older adults living in New York City Housing Authority developments. We would also were able to provide some training along with that, which has proven to be tremendous. Case management clients increased by the highest of annual amount for which data are available from 
34,937 annually in FY19 to 40,347 in FY21, which is a 15% increase. In the first half of FY20, our home delivered meals served just under two, uh, 23,000 older adults daily. That enrollment spiked to roughly 27 during the start of the pandemic, but has returned back to just over 24 million, I mean, 24,000 individuals in the first six months of FY21. Over 3.3 million wellness calls to approximately 200,000 clients have been conducted since March, 2020. Reducing social isolation, providing important program information and updates and linking clients to vital services, resources and supports. We're also incredibly grateful for the ongoing support of the city council which in FY21 awarded DIFTA over $38.1 million in discretionary funding, allowing us to make even greater investments in often underserved and unserved communities. While recognizing all these important external partnerships, I would re be remiss not to mention that this administration has over the years consistently made investments in aging services, including an overall increase of 100 million in baseline funding to basically undo the erosion to aging services that was done in the prior administration. And that 100 million has basically restored what was lost in the prior administration. This last year has challenged us to do more with our limited resources, but I continue to be proud of the work that DIFTA, the DIFTA staff, and particularly the uh, older adult network uh, has done, such as, uh, and also other city agencies, such as the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Vaccine Command Center, New York City's Emergency Management and the Fire Department, all have been collaborating to work and address the needs that have arisen during this pandemic. Older adults are fundamental stakeholders in the response to the pandemic, as such, DIFTA has brought this lens and advocacy to our sister agencies as they deepen their focus on older adults. We appreciate these collaborations and look forward to maintaining these strengthened relationships even as the pandemic is behind us. It has shown that together uh, city agencies can make this an age-friendly safe city. Service pivots, as you know, FY21 did not unfold the way we initially planned. Starting three months into to the pandemic, which disproportionately impacts Black, Brown, and Asian communities, as well as older adults, DIFTA and our providers had to quickly shift our services. You've heard this in every other hearing that we've had over the year. We had to adapt to emerging needs while remaining, ex um, while remaining accessible despite Executive Order 100. This executive order mandated the closure of multiple businesses throughout the city during the state of emergency, including the closure of all older adult congregate centers. Through these pivots, we are all reminded of the strength and the resilience, not only of older New Yorkers and their families, while also highlighting areas of need and further investments, such as technology, uh, technology access, increased support, for seniors who and increased support for seniors who choose to age in place. We also need broadband in this city. DIFTA services over the last year uh, with our providers has transitioned programs and services to be virtual and telephone based. These include friendly visiting, geriatric mental health, which has grown tremendously, caregiver support, case management, and HICAP webinars and the development of new programming such as fraud, fraud prevention and empowerment series through our elder justice group. This pandemic, as many wonderful things as we've been able to get out of it and learn from it, we also learned that predators are on the rise every day and we needed to strengthen our uh, elder justice services. Virtual programs provide older adults with flexibility to join where they can at their convenience and not have it interfered with their schedule. It was an interesting learning. It forces community connection, wellness, and intellectual, creative, and physical engagement. 
We are increasingly seeing the value in this delivery method and are working on ways to ensure that virtual programming continue post COVID to provide older adults with more choices and flexibility and state of the art programming, regardless of where they attend. Older adult centers, many of which are offered some virtual programming, pivoted quickly in order to increase virtual program offerings in such areas as social engagement. Prior to the pandemic, 47 senior centers and sites affiliated with those centers were providing virtual programming. That number has grown throughout the pandemic. And as of this January, 259 older adult centers and their affiliated sites have offered over 87,000 sessions of free programming that include fitness classes, arts and crafts, music, socialization programs via Zoom and other apps. As a result, as a result older adults now have a wider range of options and fewer barriers to attend. Centers are providing virtual program in over a dozen languages. Virtual programming is one example of adapting to a changing need for our, for our older adults. We've all learned more virtual programming and Zoom meetings than any one of us ever anticipated in our lifetime. We have learned the benefits of this option and look forward to continuing to offer increased vir uh, virtual programming in the future. At the start of the pandemic, congregate meals of older adults would transition to grab and go. It was a good meal provision, uh, provision service. It worked effectively. But then immediately after that, we saw the science told us that it was important for older adults to stay at home. And then DIFTA NYC direct meal delivery was imposed in uh, March and in April of, two, of 2020 resulting in a successful provision of 1.7 meals to older adults and 75% greater meal service participation compared to 2019. Were there hitches? Absolutely. Were there glitches? Absolutely. We've learned tremendously from that experience. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, we did an after um, program report and many of those uh, changes have already been implemented at DIFTA. Since late uh, April of last year, then Get Food New York, which was established by the mayor, he established a food czar and established Get Food New York City to address food hunger for all New Yorkers, had been responsible for filling the gap for unmet food needs for all New Yorkers. So we also know the suspension of congregate meals in senior centers has had a great impact on older adults and the center themselves and our whole network. For older adults, the absence of congregate meals results in a reduced social activity and engagement with the center itself, their trusted partners, their most trusted partners. We are eager to see senior centers continue to increase their engagement with their members and non-members as we await full reopening of senior centers. As you remember, one of my earlier hearings, I thought that was gonna happen last mm -hmm. uh, May. And then I was hopeful we would do it in July. And here we are in March of 2021, almost a year without having senior centers. Social isolation occurs when a person has little or no contact with anyone. In older adults, as you all well know, it can be harmful to their well being and lead to a variety of serious health problems, including depression, cognitive decline, and heart disease. Combating social isolation has always been a top priority for the agency. These efforts have increased over the last year. During the pandemic, as we said earlier, DIFTA and its providers, its, all of its providers have stepped up to the challenge, have been conducting thousands of wellness and check-in calls. These calls serve as an essential purpose, not only to check in on an older adult, but to provide referral services like food, friendly visiting, elder abuse, mental health, and other services that the city is setting up during a COVID-19 pandemic. To date, more than 3.3 million calls have been placed since last March. And almost, as I said earlier, 200,000 adults have been uh, reached. One of the things is that innovation has, uh, this pandemic has forced innovation and a rethinking of how we do everything. 
So one of the uh, issues that has emerged is the friendly visiting program focused uh, on isolation, largely homebound seniors who were served through DIFTA's 21 contract service managers, which covered all 59 community districts. The program matches older adults facing the negative effects of social isolation with well-trained volunteers who help spend time with them in order to provide some social interaction. As a result, friendly visiting service and a mental is a serves as a mental health intervention program. The program model expands the older adults' connection to their community and may prevent um, the isolated older adult from declining into depression and loneliness. During last year, these visits have been conducted all virtually. To address the social isolation and loneliness of older, active older adults, DIFTA also learned, launched Friendly Voices, which is a version of Friendly Visiting. Uh, and we launched that in October, 2020. This program is set up to remain virtual, even after the pandemic is over and the eligibility is open to a wide range of older adults. Friendly Voices offer older adults the option to be matched with a volunteer, a peer, or a small virtual group. The Friendly Voices program currently has opening for older adults to join. To sign up as a volunteer and older adult, individuals can call Aging Connect at 212 Two four four six four nine six nine, and as you know, we've launched a um, a PSA last uh, March, no, last May, and Lin Manuel Miranda served as our voice, and we were able to get volunteers for that uh, PSA, encouraging all New Yorkers to give five minutes of their time to to an older adult. Uh, in February twenty twenty, without. In, in any way anticipating this pandemic, DIFTA launched our Aging Connect hotline, which was to serve as a navigator as, as assistance for families and older adults uh, and introducing them to our operations and to the network at large. This pro, it was fortuitous that we did that in February. Through this program, we were ensured that older adults would have immediate and direct access to information and referrals as their families and friends would have. The line is staffed by full-time trained aging specialists and operates weekdays from 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 a.m. All of the staff speak at least one language other than English, including Spanish, Mandarin, Japanese, Cantonese, and Haitian Creole. The top call categories include benefits and entitlements, housing, meals, general information about DIFTA programs in services and services. In the first year, Aging Connect served seven, received 79,000 calls, which is an average of 302 calls per day. The annual budget for this program is 3.1 million. Aging Connect has shown to be an excellent partner and navigator. Uh, during this pandemic. Home delivered meals uh, program is another vital component of DIFTA's network, as you well said earlier, um, Chairwoman Chin. Not only do home delivered meals provide sustenance for homebound older adults across the five boroughs, the interaction with a delivery person, which for many seniors might be the only direct human interaction for the day, supports our ongoing efforts to combat social isolation which was, as you all know, exacerbated uh, during this pandemic. The driver would not be able most of the time to have direct contact or leave the meal outside the individual's door. The number of meals delivered to homebound older adults increased by 5% between nine, uh, 2019 and, 20, and FY20. In 2020, a total of 4 million 950,426 meals were delivered by our providers. In the spring of 2020, DIFTA consolidated the 23 contracts into 15 contracts, giving the providers more flexibility in how they manage the expenses of these contracts. The total budget for this program is $41.8 million. Through the contracts, DIFTA funded programs are able to address the most critical overarching goals of the Home Delivered Meals Program, 
including increasing meal options for recipients, embracing the diversity of our city by increasing the availability of culturally aligned meals, and vegetarian, halal, kosher, Latin, Pan-Asian, and promoting uniformly high quality meals from good food. Also a great initiative, and I know it's important to you, Chairwoman too, is the social adult daycare programs. Local law nine of 2015 required that all social adult daycare centers uh, operating in city are required to register with DIFTA and that DIFTA also serves as an ombudsman for any complaints against these facilities. In FY20, uh, DIFTA received registration forms for, from for, uh, 262 out of the 347 centers. From January to December 20, there were 140 distinct allegations received. 36% of the allegations were related to potential Medicaid fraud. As such, the senior adult daycare centers use cash and or goods as incentive to enroll potential adults into the program and or billing for services not rendered. This year's centers have remained closed to in-persons gathering as all congregate settings have, but, and there have been 11 complaints filed so far for failure to comply with Executive Order 100, which bans congregate um, gatherings during this pandemic. In addition to the pivots having to be made uh, to address the pandemic itself, DIFTA has been happy to support the efforts of the Vaccine Command Center, the VVC as, uh, the VCC as it's commonly known, in, co in helping it in COVID vaccine rollout with our existing resources. Upon the expansion of the vaccine eligibility to older adults, we immediately activated our providers to start contacting older adult clients to distribute information about the vaccine as well as assist folks in scheduling their appointment. DIFTAs and its providers are currently making thousands of calls a day in which we share information about vaccines, make appointments, and when necessary, uh, 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 provide available transportation options. We have also sent robocalls in several languages directly to older adults as part of this outreach. In partnership with the VCC, we've worked with City Meals on Wheels to place printed collateral about older New, what older New Yorkers need to know about the vaccine and their home delivered meal prox, uh, boxes to approximately 20,000 clients. To supplement the free ambulance and taxi services offered by the city, many of our senior centers have made their vehicles available to support older adults access to the vaccine, uh, vaccination appointments. We know the the best systems have been laid out. However, supply has, uh, has never been able to meet the demand. We believe that we'll have a breakthrough in that rather shortly. So lots of frustration around the supply and demand issues. Um, DIFTER is also supporting the plan to vaccinate individuals, adults who are homebound as well. For those who have limited mobility, bringing vaccine centers as close to them as possible is essential. With a focus on the 33 neighborhoods identified by the task force on racial inclusion and, and equity, the city has set up temporary vaccine clinics at many NYCHA senior center and community centers, as well as within NORCs. Now that a vaccine is available that is more easily transported, the city has started a pilot door-to-door -door campaign with the New York City Fire Department, and will soon incorporate healthcare provider experience in home base, in home base case of uh, such as visiting doctors and nurses, as well as larger providers, including Northwell, Mount Sinai, and Montefi uh, Montefiore, to provide in-home vaccinations to those who are unable to leave their home. DIFTA and providers are reaching out to clients who are known or likely to be homebound within our programs to confirm that they would like an in-home vaccine. Currently in its initial phase, the program would scale up in the next coming weeks as supply of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine increases 
this uh, vaccine does not have the same requirements, storage requirements as Moderna and Pfizer. In support of the direct uh, vaccine distribution, DIFTA uh, staff has signed up to volunteer weekends at city-run vaccination distribution centers, ensuring that those with appointments have a seamless process upon a, a arrival. I have served as a secret shopper in many of the sites to ensure that access and services for older adults are adequate. I cannot reiterate enough how important our providers and community partnerships are, how the DIF the staff has stepped up through this process from calling older adults to helping schedule appointments, disseminating information and advocating for local sites. Our partners continue to advocate for and provide support to their community. We appreciate those services. We appreciate these efforts. We could not have been able to serve older adults without this partnership. In conclusion, I will always say, there are always more ideas for which funding is necessary, but I continue to be proud of the great work that DIFTA and our providers have uh, accomplished with our resources, our current resources. Despite difficult financial times, we have been able to meet the needs of older adults across the city, develop new programs, and expand reach to older adults who had not been previously known to DIFTA, which means that we have uh, the number of 1.4 million older adults. Many more of those are now known to um, to Department for the Aging as well as our providers. And it's one of the things that you, Chairwoman Chin, have always said that we need to make sure that we tap into that new uh, pool of older adults who had not been uh, served with by us before. Last year has highlighted the resiliency of older adults as well as the system gaps that should be strengthened in order to fully allow people to live in their community as long as they desire. We believe in a city where people should be aging in place with dignity and prevent institutionalization for as long as possible. And we are very pleased that AARP has joined in that same message. As we look towards uh, the future, I look forward to continuing to explore ways to match services to increase demands. We are excited to continue to innovate services, not just as the pandemic lessens, but as we look forward to the future and the changing needs of our city and the changing demographics of older New Yorkers in this city. This is going to be the most age inclusive, age friendly city in the United States. As always, we are grateful to you uh, Chairwoman Chin, for your advocacy, for your support, personal and professional, and also to the committee for your advocacy and continued partnership as we all support older New Yorkers thrive and live in this city. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner. We will now turn it to the chair for questions. Um, thank you, Commissioner. We also have been joined by Council Member Malone, Council Member Traeger, and Council Member Deutsch. I'm going to start off with a couple of questions and then I'm going to turn it to my colleagues uh, to also ask some questions. Uh, Commissioner, thank you to your testimony. And you know, we had a strong partnership uh, in this session. And I hope that in this budget, we will help build a foundation for the future for DIFTA. And we have to increase the budget for DIFTA. The older adult population is growing, but just the budget is not growing. <laughs> I mean, it's still less than half a percent of the city's $9.2 billion budget. And that is unconscionable. And we got to really fight for more. Uh, even though you talked about the administration increasing the budget because of our advocacy, but it's just not enough. I mean, looking back at the um, you talked about the senior center utilization. In 2020, in the calendar year of 2020, senior center utilization was down 15% from 2019. Uh, DIFTA reached 108,000 senior with its virtual programming this year. But in, in an ordinary year, there are usually about 7.6 million duplicated seniors who come to the center to have meals. And so how do you think that DIFTA, why do you think that DIFTA was not able to continue to reach as many seniors during COVID 
And then what resources are in the budget to bring these seniors back uh, to the DIFTA program? And then the other thing is that I know that we talked about in some of the past hearing, we were hopeful that you gave the indication that we might have some activity started in the center. So what is the timeline for reopening the senior center uh, for the meal program and for our NORCs and, and other in-person service? So that is about eight questions and I'm gonna to try to remember all of them, Madam Chair, and try to do one by one. In terms of the data, uh, of whether we serve as many older adults as we have in the past. It is a matter of trying to, at this point, reconcile the data with Get Food, as well as the data with the wellness and give a, a fuller picture. We have, that has not been done yet. We've been, uh, as we say in Spanish, friendo y comiendo, we're cooking and uh, eating at the same time. So we're looking at that data so that we can have a holistic picture of exactly how many older adults have been served. As for the opening of the older adult centers, we have to rely on the science. That's what we trust and that's what we rely on. When we get guidance that there is enough either herd immunity or whatever the new terms are, where it is safe for older adults to congregate, then we will be um, moving in that direction. That being said, we have never um, and are continue to work with our uh, providers. Uh, 180 of them have said that they're interested should we have the opportunity and we're working with OMB right now is to get them re-engaged in the meal provision so that we can go to a direct delivery program, similar to Get Food, similar to what we did as DIFTA Direct 1, we're calling it DIFTA Direct 2, until the date that we can open the older adult centers. It's to get the programs engaged. And there's 180 of them right now uh, that have been reviewed. And we are uh, in, uh, in partnership with OMB reviewing those so that we can get those going as soon as possible. Um, the other question was um, related to the changing demographics and the size of DIFTA's budget. You know, as I well know, that given the change in the demographics of the older adults, given the change in the growth numbers and where we've identified service gaps, we are constantly looking for innovation and new approaches so that we could address those gaps uh, because the status quo is not going to, one, does not lead us to the future, and more importantly, does not serve the needs of even current older adults, much less uh, the future and the number that we anticipate, particularly the changing demographics. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was surprised that I didn't see any new needs um, in the DIFTA budget. Uh, and in your testimony, you talked about the success of all these virtual program, which is really looking at the future of connecting more older adults. And there was no request um, for new needs for technology. I know that you and I have talked about before um, in the budget. I mean, how do we help more seniors have access to the training, um, to tablets, uh, laptop? I mean, the, the, the program, that you talked about, the 10,000 to NYCHA seniors, um, that's a drop in the bucket, right? And so how do we ensure that more seniors uh, will have this resource? Because as you said earlier, I mean, it's just a great way of connecting to more seniors who might not go to the traditional uh, senior center for meal, but they'll get online and participate in an exercise program and other kind of program. Uh, so, do you anticipate, um, do you, did DIFTA have any information on how many seniors um, lack the technology access um, that could benefit from it? And then how is DIFTA offering, another thing is that the budgetary flexibility uh, for provider um, to get technology to seniors during COVID? Uh, to get them connected online. 
Right. So during this during this process, we worked again. One of our sister agencies, it has been the the chief technology officer, and we've been working very closely with them on some models where we could expand the program uh, modeled after the NYCHA program, but even expand that. And we're looking at that. We had um, something like 20 innovative volunteers uh, from high tech industry are working with us to come up with some designs. And so we're looking at that right now. We know that uh, it cost us a million, a million, a million two um, for uh, oats, you know, to do the training for the NYCHA program and the ongoing support for the NYCHA program. So we have some uh, indication. We constantly work with, with, um, with OMB on all of these conversations around innovations and future directions and aging in place with dignity. And so those conversations are always ongoing with OMB. The thing that we have encountered uh, in addition to this pandemic, uh, as you well know, and many of you know, um, has been the financial downturn in the city. And so with the uh, with this change in this new administration in Washington and with some relief that we think that those conversations can continue, um, can continue and maybe bear some fruit. But at this point, this city is has faced an enormous uh, financial downturn and um, which has also impacted us. But there's hope coming in the future. So that's what I, in my opening, I wanted to dip to really think about, well, how do we plan for the future? Anticipating that there will be some resource coming and we need to really be prepared for that. Um, in December of 2020, um, there was $900 billion from the stimulus that included a $3.2 billion through an emergency broadband benefit to help millions of students, families, unemployed workers to afford broadband that they need during the pandemic. Was STIFTA coordinating to inform uh, older adults, eligible seniors uh, who might be able to apply for this benefit? that are on SNAP and Medicaid? I would have to get back to you because I, I will see what we were doing with the virtual programming. I don't have that readily available. I'll have to get back to you on that. What I can tell you is with the, for the homebound, what we did was um, we were able to, because of the increased demand in home delivered meals with the stimulus money that we received that DIFTA, we dedicated it to home delivered meals. And we've been able to, we set aside money so that we can continue meeting that increase till this July. Um, and, um, and our home delivered meals, uh, the increase in our home delivered meals are covered until then. Well, with the home delivered meal program, um, I think there were about 73,000 seniors that received the Get Food uh, program in 2020. And then DIFTA had to transfer around 800 eligible seniors um, that are eligible for home delivered meal to get food uh, due to the overutilization of the home delivered meal program. So how much more funding is needed to fund the full need of the home delivered meal program? And how is SIFTA reconnecting the seniors who are on Get Food to go back to the Home Delivered Meal Program? Absolutely. And, uh, and that's exactly one of the issues that we're working on right now, Chairwoman Chin. We recognize, for us, there was a, you know, in, in order of priority, it was to make sure that no one went uh, on, uh, an older homebound adult did not go hungry, right? Um, and one of the things that we did was during the case management process, if the home delivered meal provider in their particular area was at capacity, even over capacity, uh, and could not provide services, we immediately got them on to get food. That was, that was the priority. And what we're doing right now is looking at how many are on get food, what is the capacity of the home delivered meal programs currently, and um, and what will we need to continue to support those 
uh, individuals on Get Food. Jose, do you want to add anything on the home delivered meals budget portion that I may be, I had missed? No, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner, you actually hit all the, the high points. Yeah. Okay. So we're over, we're over capacity and um, our providers are at capacity and, and working hard and for, and we use get food as a default. Okay. Well, so I, told the, the I, I told the OMB director when we had the finance hearing that providers are asking for another $16.6 .6 million for the home delivery meal program so that we meet the national average because right now uh, we're paying provider much less uh, for the, from the national average. And a lot of them are suffering deficits from this program and that should not be the case. So we're advocating for more money on that. Um, I'm and, gonna and, go okay, back. I, I, I hear you, but I also wanna remind you that we also last year, as you well know, and, and with your support, we were able to increase the meal cost, the per meal cost for home delivered meals last year. Yeah, but not enough. So we gotta do more. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna pass on to my uh, colleague to ask to get a chance to ask some questions and then I'll, I'll come back with some of the other questions. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please limit your questions to five minutes. The Surgeon at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. We will first hear from Council Member Ayala, followed by Council Member Vallone, and then Council Member Deutsch. Council Member Ayala? Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, good, morning. good morning, everyone. So just, I have two questions. One of them is regarding, so I know that we don't have a date yet and we, it's, it's, you know, there's no way to predict when senior centers will be able to open. But I'm wondering as the weather starts to get nicer, has there been any thought process to maybe um, using some of the uh, open streets as a possibility for outdoor programming for maybe exercise classes, um, I know, you know, jewelry making, painting, these are, you know, um, no touch, low contact type of activities that can be, I'm sorry, my staff left their phone there and is ringing. Um, but these are activities that can be done outdoors that would allow for some level of, you know, of interaction among peers. And I know that they would love it. Um, and then two, the second question is really is regarding the uh, mental health training. So we we voted on that bill in October, I think of 2018, to require uh, the mental health first aid training for uh, case workers and, and individuals that work in senior centers that are coming, you know, interfacing with the, the senior adult population. And I'm wondering, has any of that training um, started um, because I'm concerned, right? As as people, you know, we're in year one of this pandemic, uh, a whole year without, you know, that that level of interaction. Um, as caseworkers are making these calls, are they able, better able, or better prepared to identify mental health issues, depression in older adults that they're uh, interacting with? Great, thank you for the questions. All right, so I'm going to take the first one first. All right, uh, Council Member. Um, we have been working very closely with the Department of Health and Mental Health on guidance on what kind of activities can we uh, provide. And we uh, almost weekly, we meet with them as, as programs come to us with ideas of, can I do this? Can I do that? We meet with uh, the Department of Health to get some guidance. We have been talking for a while and this came straight from the network. Um, talking for a while, can we do meals outdoors? How can we How can we do some meals? How can we do activities? How can we do Tai Chi? All which can require, you know, distance, you know, Tai Chi is an important form of exercise for us, but it's also key in all senior centers because it's a fall prevention uh, uh, process. And so it's, it's one of those activities that's very important to, along with many others in certain dance classes. And so we're working with the Department of Health and Mental Health to give us some guidance 
on what we can do, the number of people we can do, the kind, the kind of requirements that we would have to put in place. Just like we did uh, council member Ayala when we started opening cooling centers last year. Um, we, we went through a very rigorous um, process with them as to what the guidelines were. And uh, we're doing that every day and looking into that. As for the mental health, uh, first aid mental health, yes, that has been done. I'll get back to you with the number of sessions and the number of people uh, trained to date. All right? I will. Thank you. Thank you. Always. Thank, thank you, Council Member. We will now hear from Council Member Vallon. Time starts now. Good morning, Commissioner. How are you? Good, good. Thank like you. Said, this is our last one together. I know Mighty I know. Mighty Margaret, as we call our, our aging chair, and I have been from day one for eight years, and it'll be bittersweet next year watching us without us. But um, you know we always champion diff to, to have more fun, right? That's, that's our role. And I, I guess seeing after eight years that this committee and under Margaret, seeing a budget, so it's not you, it comes from the administration. If the budget goes from 50 billion to 90 billion in those eight years, and we're still at that half a percent, you, know, you just cry inside because you know there are so many more seniors that we can reach, but with the budget that you have, it's, it, it's, you're doing the work you can with what you have, but we are always going to fight for that extra funding. And that, that, that's a big hope of mine for the next administration to finally prioritize in that budget. I, I got a question I want to pass on, and maybe you can help. And this could be pretty easy if, if, if what they're saying is correct. So I have three of the larger providers. I have um, Common Point, I have Self Help, I have Hanick, and a couple of smaller. And, and they're saying that as of July 1st, they were told by DIFTA to not use the funding that they, the small amount of funding they had for budget for home delivered meals. And they still have yet to get the green light to use that. And they want to provide the home delivered meals, but they have to use private funding to do that. That seems like something that we can do rather quickly or like they're not getting an answer as to when that can be green lighted for the budget that they did have, they were told don't use it. Can, can we take a look at that and see I that, will take a me, look at that because that doesn't sound familiar or correct at all. So yeah, I will definitely- from when July 1st, I guess when they decided home delivered meals would stop at, at that point being funded, they have yet to get the green light. That's you know, over seven months now. So they've had to raise private funding to meet the needs of the seniors because there is a budget allocated amount that they have in the contract, but they've been told not to use that. So maybe that's something, if we could look at that pretty quickly, that would be a quick way I to will, get some extra- definitely look at that because that doesn't even sound correct to me all right and um and i oh. and you know and i have the greatest respect for hammock i mean i love i you oh, know, they've been, i don't know what i would have done out here without them they have been yeah no they i mean and 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 and, and, and self-help also so they're excellent providers we'll look into that and i immediately after this hearing i'll get back to you that right? would be wonderful because that's something we and could i do. will make sure that our staff gets back to them all right Perfect. correct whatever Right. And the, the last, the only thing I wanted to think of is, is going through what we all went through in this last year is how do we maybe tackle or do things different in the future, in my eyes, when something happens again, right? And we all have to take new precautions for whatever comes. Like we saw in the schools, the kids needed to do virtual. And unfortunately, still with the high schools, a lot, a lot of the kids have either chosen to be home or still home. But without that technology, they would not have been able to continue some type of teaching. If the lesson for here is that we were not able to get to our seniors in their centers and the, the deprivation of that family and human contact has been instrumental on new mental health issues and, and continuing for our seniors. We have to incorporate a new approach on how we can get them into in a different way. And to me, the only way is that is with technology. And I wanted to follow on Chair Chin's conversation before, I mean, the only, uh, virtual technology we have in Mars is when we funded from our own council when we, we did a virtual lab. But two things would happen. Uh, the seniors had to stay separate in their areas and couldn't go through common points. So the difficulty would be some type of tablet for each, which would be a dream, but the budget there wouldn't support that now. But we would have to maybe think of some type of virtual area, virtual laptop computer access for critical uh, services, for doctors, for mental health, for exercising, and for families to see their loved ones. And that 
is something that I would think maybe we can try to build a plan for that coming for, I mean, this budget's happening now, but I'm actually gonna work with Margaret to put a bill in to start to, to focus to require that because it's the only way I think we're gonna get something. But is that something that maybe we could focus for and maybe lay the groundwork for the embassy? Yeah, first of all, thank you. Um, because it's what, three things I want to respond to you. One is we are doing, we did an after, after action report on DIFTA Direct Meals One, and we did a lot of learnings and it, it uncovered things that we changed our system. One of them was the way that we maintain data, up-to-date data on clients and how, you know, cause we learned, you know, we had old uh, data and, you know, we needed to have a system that had some integrity in it. And so we hired someone to do integrity checks on the data, not integrity checks for violation, but integrity checks to make sure that the data is the most current and are working with our partners in that. Um, so that was one major lesson learned. The other, the other uh, lesson, and so that goes to the heart of your issue is how do we have access and how do we get information to them, right? And so that is one of the things that we've done. We are also doing after action report on the NYCHA uh, tablet program to show what was what worked there, what doesn't, and where do we need to expand. But you're absolutely right. And one of the things that this whole virtual world has taught us is that we should have a library. You know, and so what we've done is try to catalog and work with partners in the network to start cataloging some of those trainings, putting them into a library. And we're looking at what, you know, a, a library, a virtual library. I have, don't ask me. No, that's, question. and you have had, you've spoken to that in the past. That's a great idea. All the partners. And so, from, and so it's like, either, put, put, have a repository. Don't ask me the technical stuff. I will uh, fail uh, and I will make it up. That's for somebody and so, else. But, but having a repository where people can have access to that programming. And if I were a family member and I'm taking my mother upstate, that then she could still have access to that and I could enable that because I can tap into that system. And those are the kind of things that we're looking at and that we've learned how, and also embracing family members and neighbors and, and extended family members more in this thing that we called breaking social isolation, you know, which is not just the- I, I, Those are all wonderful. I, until we get though an actual piece of hardware, additional laptops, additional Absolutely. virtual, then, it, then all the data is not still giving us a human contact to the seniors that we couldn't get to see. And it broke my heart on so many levels. I mean, on another world, I do elder law and all my clients can't get to see or they couldn't be them when they passed or when they were very sick or when the COVID was at its peak, no one could have any, and there, there was, couldn't even see them. So maybe- I, I'd like to focus then, that, that strictly would have to be budget because we know it works. We'd have to get some type of community uh, center tablet or larger screen and then hopefully in the future by floor and by room so that folks could have those services, the library you're talking about, and also see a loved one or a doctor individually safely yeah. without mixing with it. And, and, Thank and, you, Chair, I didn't mean to go. Yeah, and I was gonna say this tablet, there's smartphones, there's so many other- a new, a new, new apparatus that we should be tapping into. Absolutely. Thank you, and thank you for looking in on the food service for the for the providers. Something about the contract being not used for services. So if we could look at yeah, that today, we'll, that'd be great. yeah, we'll get back to you on that immediately. Thank, thank you. Thank and you, them. All right, Commissioner. Right. Uh, to follow up with, thank you, Councilmember Malone, for your strong advocacy and partnership. It's been wonderful <laughs> working with you in the past, you know, eight years. Um, and we got to make this a strong budget this year. And that's why we need new need. Uh, Commissioner, uh, maybe talking with the provider to come up with uh, some idea of how much so that we can advocate uh, to get it into this budget. Um, we also been joined by Council Member Eugene. So um, committee council, you can call on the next council member with question. Thank you, Chair. We will now hear from Councilmember Deutsch. Time starts now. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm sorry I'm not on Zoom because I have notes on my phone. <laughs> and uh, okay. So according to data, the number of homeless individuals uh, age 65 plus increased over 300% from 2004 to 2017. 
And it continues to, to say that if nothing is done by 2030, uh, the homeless population uh, for seniors can triple. Now, I'm, I'm extremely concerned about the future of senior housing and the current situation of when a senior can't afford their rent, and even with all the programs such as SCREE. Now, I have been working on a senior housing plan in my district since the beginning of 2019, and this administration has been dragging their feet, and then I'm talking about hundreds of senior housing in my district. I have a plan. I have the, the space that's owned by uh, city-owned, and up until yesterday, the administration's been ignoring um, land use and city planning regarding my plan since the beginning of 2019. Now, what role does DIFTA play in senior homelessness? And what conversations uh, does DHS, in particular Commissioner Banks, uh, have with Department of Aging? to work with your office on future senior housing, as well as um, seniors possibly being evicted or displaced from their apartments when they cannot afford their rent. All right, let me, let me take that, parse it out as, as I best I can and try to answer your inquiries. As for senior, older adults who are homeless, we have three programs that we work with, uh, Project Finds and uh, several other programs. We have a program that um, provides uh, supports for men who live in a veterans uh, who are homeless or who live in uh, shelters. So we, we work closely with those providers that provide those services. We also work very closely uh, with NYCHA. If a older person is finding themselves at point of eviction, we have some interventions and relationships so that we can uh, bring in some services and try to prevent that, um, that uh, dispossessed notice or um, anything of that nature. We work very closely with HPD. You know that the city has a goal of uh, a housing goal for older adults. Um, we are well into that program and we work very closely with HPD to constantly advocate for older adult housing. We know that it is essential because as a city, we believe and are committed to people aging in place with dignity and part of that it requires a home uh, so that older adults can do that to avoid institutionalization. Um, housing is a critical need in this city and it has been a great shortage. But as far as coordination with those sister agencies who have primary responsibility, it is something that we do on a regular basis. And we also support the network to ensure that we prevent homelessness wherever possible so what is the what is the goal um and has that uh goal been met the senior the development of 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 older adult affordable housing the, the mayor had a goal i think that believe that that was established um about two years ago, that, that goal, and I will get to you as to what percentage has been um, what percentage has been met. I do not have that data with me. I will get back to you. Now, do you, um, do you have any data on how many seniors have applied for the rental uh, one-shot payments? I will have to get back to you on that. Okay. Um, do you have conversations with Commissioner Banks about uh, senior homelessness? I have our, I have conversations with uh, Commissioner Banks on many items, including homelessness as well as food insecurity and income insecurity. Those are conversations are, that we have regularly. Did the, does the Commissioner Banks um, does he like um, collaborate with you on on senior housing plans that council members uh, bring up to him? 
I cannot speak about individual items. I don't recall us discussing individual projects. When was the last time Commissioner Banks um, had a conversation with Department of Aging about senior homelessness? Do you, can you recall that? No, I can't. Um, was it any time within the last year? I'm sure it was within the last year because well, it, I'm don't... sure it's centered around the pandemic and the homelessness and concerns we both share around the pandemic. So my question is like, um, if a senior cannot afford rent, um, where does where does the Department of Aging um, refer them to, and how does that how is that followed up? If a senior cannot afford rent, it depends on who the referral source is. It usually is a community agency that then will advocate and turn it to the appropriate city agency to get that support. Um, uh, okay. Do you um? Or they do you will feel, vote. Do you feel that we need to build more senior housing? Of course, we need to build more senior housing. Um, of course, we do. We, there's a shortage of housing in this city. There's a shortage of affordable housing. There's a shortage of senior housing, and the and the and the administration has a very ambitious goal for senior housing. Yeah, because it doesn't seem that it's that ambitious because if I have a plan in my district for senior housing since the beginning of 2019 and I can get a meeting with Commissioner Banks to push this project, it doesn't seem that they're quite ambitious about it. Would you, Commissioner, would you support um, and help me um, and support my plan for senior housing? Uh, to put some more pressure on this administration to move along with that plan? What I am willing to do, sir, with all due respect, is look at your plan, talk to you about your plan, and also find out what the status of your plan is. There's no status because the city's been dragging their feet. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's approximately uh, between 15, 80,000 square feet of, of land. And um, it's um, it's right in, in Brighton Beach, and it's uh, only Council, yeah. Council Member Deutsch, I think we could follow up on offline because uh, on Friday's hearing uh, with HPD, they do have programs um, that subsidize you know building of senior housing, and there's a goal, and so we could also help reach out uh, to HPD on this. Usually, it's a non uh, I mean, you could have a nonprofit provider uh, putting together that program, but you and I can follow up offline and see how we can be helpful. Okay, I just wanna end off by saying that I'm very disappointed with this administration when it comes to building um, affordable housing and in particular for senior citizens with such a high homeless rate in New York City. And I'm extremely disappointed, and I hope that um, I could work together with the Department of Aging Commission. I just want to say that you do an amazing job, and I support all the work that you do. And we have a great chair who advocates for our senior population and uh, people with disabilities. I, I just want to say for the record that I'm extremely disappointed um, with our administration when it comes to reaching their goals for providing senior housing where many seniors um, have been displaced and are being evicted. When, when we see this rent, when we see the rent moratorium end in May, we don't know what's going to happen with 60,000 homeless people out in the streets. And um, we could see a double once the moratorium ends. So I just invited Commissioner Banks for a citywide town hall meeting to talk about uh, what the city's plan is that once this moratorium ends, how are they gonna deal um, with, with additional people who may uh, end up homeless uh, on our streets? So thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Deutsch. Are there any other council member that wanna ask a question? Seeing that there are no other council members with their hands raised, I'll turn it back to you, Chair Chen. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I just wanted to follow up. In your testimony, you did talk about uh, the private social adult daycare. Um, 
and the number that was registered. How did DIFTA work with them during the pandemic? Because um, they were not open. Do we know that if they contacted their client um, to provide services like our senior centers were doing? One of the things that we did was frankly, uh, Chairwoman Chin, and I'll get back to you on exactly what we did, but I can tell you where we spent most of our time was making sure that they were not open. And we had to focus on the, the I can tell you the ones run by DIFTA, you know, with your support, uh, were in constant touch with their clients and providing mm -hmm. virtual services. And what our goal was with the other ones was to make sure that they were not opening and uh, making sure um, that, you know, that was our main focus because we kept getting information that they were open and we had to oh. go back and keep reminding them that they could not be open uh, and the and the risk that 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 was being um, exposed. So, but I can I will get back to you on that exactly uh, what kind of oversight we don't have oversight of them. The, that's a state requirement. Our our role is as an ombudsman mm. that you, that you as, um, frankly, that you uh, ensured that the city had some role is as an ombudsman, you know, which is to handle complaints and mm. refer complaints to the appropriate authority. Yeah, I think a lot of um, those clients uh, did reach out uh, to DIFTA or our senior service provider and got connected with yeah. Get Food or, um, I mean, no. that's the, the growing number of seniors that I think you've talked about uh, in other hearings. Yeah. Uh, the I, don't, huge I, don't have, I don't have data, but I wouldn't be surprised that that was a contributor to the increase for home delivered meals. I don't have, we don't have so data to corroborate that, but I'm so not. Commissioner, I can jump in. I mean, basically there were basically, a lot of them did pivot to doing uh, outreach to their clients online. They did get paid to do that. Yes, that was part of their Medicaid reimbursement, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah because we good. because we heard some complaint from actually some of the SAC saying that they were not getting the, the reimbursement amount uh, for what they were doing. I said, well, talk to your MLTC and right. the state. Um, great, thank you. Um, so thank I you, just Jose. wanted to focus a couple of questions on the future. Yes. of the uh, older adult center. Uh, because in your, um, in my opening, I talked about you know, the need um, and in your own analysis with city planning, you mentioned that 29 out of 59 uh, community uh, district needs more senior centers, right? And so we didn't get the 10 million that was promised. I mean, that's not even enough, but we just wanna make sure that that 10 million is in this budget. And I, met, I, and I told the OMB director um, during the hearing. So what is the, the, the strategy to meet this need? Um, and have you made uh, a request to OMB to talk about increased funding uh, for senior centers, because there is a great need. Okay. I wanna to talk to you about the future. We know that there is gonna be tremendous growth. We know that there are many more people aging in place, uh, which is why we see uh, the diversity of particular communities changing so much. We know that given that growth, uh, we anticipate that there will be a need for anywhere between 17 to 19 senior centers, as well as additional NORCs or included in that as additional NORCs. That is the future. Um, we, are, we also know that in-home services are going to be required um, as more people age in place. And we want to include ensure that this is a city that is uh, age inclusive where people could age in place with dignity. So those are all givens and we, you know, we have scenarios for, for all of those um, 
of those growth opportunities. We know that they are, um, and it's interesting to see that there is a correlation between the 33 districts that were the high need districts that, that were identified by the racial equity uh, task force, that there is an overlap of service gaps in some of those um, in some of those districts also, and that they will be experiencing the growth. So that all of that data and projecting forward is um, is known. But what we also know, uh, Chairwoman Chin, is that the status quo is not going to be able to meet the needs of of um, as we exist currently is not going to be able to meet the needs of the future. Well, there's going to be federal money coming, right? That is the, the, the positive outlook. And but we don't see uh, the increase in funding or uh, increase in the this, uh, 2022 budget. It doesn't reflect the needs. And that's why we need to work with you to advocate with OMB. I mean, we need more senior housing. There's no capital money um, in DFTA's budget. So how are we going to build more new senior centers, right? I mean, all these capital projects, a project that's funded by the council because of individual requests. Um, we are in constant communication with OMB <laughs> and uh, sharing with them the future. We got to make sure that the stimulus money that's coming, that we got to fight for our fair share. I mean, like that that's what has to be in this budget. And so, Commissioner, uh, you got to work with us, work with me to make sure that they don't take that. First of all, they don't take back the money that was promised like last year. Right. We saw the 10 million in the executive budget and then it disappeared. Uh, but that's not even enough. But if federal money are coming, we have to make sure that gets into uh, DIFTA's budget. I'm always so appreciative how, how, and supportive. I'm always appreciative and I welcome your strong advocacy. Well, we have to really continue uh, to work on that. I just, there's one minor point that I want to make on the technology. I mean, yes. the city has the the public access channel, and I know that we talked about some past hearing, that some programming, like the virtual programming, uh, the library that you talked about, I mean, some of them could be put into the public access channel because everybody, pretty much everybody has a television, you know, has a TV um, that be able to uh, get that and certain program uh, could be put into those channel then reaches, you know, more of the senior population especially the one that right now don't have the technology. I mean, that could be a, a way to fill the gap. Uh, so that's yeah, something that's, that I think we should work together. Yeah, I think, I, thank you for that. I think it's something we will pursue. Right now, we're going to be uh, launching an, uh, an anti-ageism, a combating ageism. You're gonna love the, the, you're gonna love the artwork. As a matter of fact, I think I'm gonna share it with you real soon after this hearing. And you're going to see some of it. It really is about aging is ageless. And, um, and uh, Beth from uh, AARP has also been a strong partner in this. So we're really excited about it. Yeah. Oh, Beth. Yeah. There you go. Yes. And yeah. uh, we're really, we're really between, I, I'm always grateful to AARP for their support around, you know, aging in place and their support around breaking the status quo. So I'm always so, so wel welcome them. But we'll share that with you. But one of the things, the reason I'm bringing this up is because we're using some city channels that we normally would not have used to launch this campaign, like the curb and the taxis. And so the idea of using public access television also just, you know, will just enhance um, our reach. So thank you for that suggestion. You're gonna, no, love, I mean, you're gonna love this campaign. Oh, I'm looking forward to it because uh, yeah, last night yeah, at yeah, yeah, I yeah. was I was at a workshop with Dress for Success uh, alumni, and we talked a lot about how to fight ageism and age discrimination. AARP showed the video 
which was oh, very oh interesting. God. Isn't that, isn't that video, I mean, that, that, I think that video is one that got my fire, the one for her age, that one, uh, is that what you're talking about? It, yes, yes that's the one. Excuse me. It really <laughs> touched the button with me, you know? <laughs> yeah, yep. I know. So, yeah. uh, I know that we want to make sure that the public have a chance to, to uh, testify and speak, uh, but my last question, I think, oh, I do want to also touch on the, uh, um, wait list for case management and home care, even though I think some of the home care uh, number might have kind of decreased during the pandemic because there were some concerns from clients. Maybe you could address that. But definitely there was a huge increase in case management uh, wait lists. And so how are is DEFTA dealing with that in terms of you know, more um, funding to meet that need? Yeah, there's no, there's no denying that this pandemic has illustrated the greater need for in-home services and the demand for that as people are aging in place. But I just want to also say that the wait list numbers is always this discussion that we have about, um, is that a traditional wait list? Case management agencies do an assessment from the very beginning and what that number reflects is not that someone is void of services. They're just not maybe have gotten all of the service. So it's like a triage kind of an approach. Uh, so someone might be wait listed for additional home care hours, but they're already receiving some home care hours. Mm -hmm. Or someone might be wait listed for another service. So it's not a traditional wait list where someone is not without service. Yes, of course, there's some people just because of, um, of the increased demand. But it's not the traditional wait list. And I always try to get people to understand that because case management agencies who do an incredible job because they're triaging people at all times and making sure that they have access to as many services as possible. So it's the okay. number is I mean never as high as it appears because someone might be waiting, but they're waiting for additional hours. Um, or maybe we're trying to bring them back from get food, but people are getting some level of service. And then- I mean, traditionally, yeah. Go ahead. I'm and sorry. traditionally we have put in um, money extra to, money. Extra money, we put in that. extra money last year to, to really cut that down. And, and it's a commitment and an, an effort that we're on constant relationship with our case management agencies. Um, and, you know, like all other agencies, we meet with them on a regular basis to triage these kind of issues. Well, I think we should really get uh, some definite number in terms of from the, the service provider, what is the wait list? You know, how many right. people we'll are waiting for, for services so that we know that how much more resources that we need to advocate, especially you know, the home care, I mean, that is such a wonderful program for uh, older adults who are not on Medicaid. I mean, these are hardworking uh, older adults that has contributed um, to the tax base and they've worked hard for the city and now they need help. And absolutely, we've heard back from the seniors who gotten this support and how great it is for them. Uh, so we got to make and sure there's the resources in there. And don't yeah. forget, they, they provide home care, but they, we also provide respite through the caregiver program. And these are supports that are essential for people to age in place. I mean, I, you don't get a lot of complaints about these programs. No, and a lot of people still don't know about the program. So when I mentioned it to them, they were like surprised that they can actually, oh, I could, I don't, I'm not on Medicaid. I, can I, I qualify? So a lot of people don't even know this resource is available. So my last question is on the Senior Center RFP. Uh, I mean, last year this time, you know, we, we heard that, oh, the RFP is gonna come out. And then five months later, it, it didn't happen. And then there was some miscommunication provided thought that they only had a short period of time. But I mean, officially I asked for a delay uh, because right now centers are dealing with so many different issues uh, and we got to make sure that the budget um, is there, that we have enough resources to really support the expansion uh, of the, 
the senior center. So will you consider uh, postponing the RFP past the July 1st, uh, that was supposed to be the award date deadline? So I've been very responsive and respectful about everybody's issues around the RFP. And to that, I would say that it will be virtually impossible to have a July 1st start date if we delay and postpone any longer. We have taken everyone's considerations. There will be an RFP in 22, whether it's a July 1st start date, more than likely not, but there will be an RFP. We cannot continue with the status quo. Too much has changed in this city for us not to do that. Um, but we are also being as, as responsive as we have been. And you know, you know that I've said this to you that an RFP has to come up so that we can really start shaping for current state, which is very different. These programs have been in place since for some of them for 10 years, nine years. Uh, the last time we issued an RFP and it was on a small scale was seven years ago. Who the older adult is today, who New York City is today is very different than it was. And it's for all of us. I keep hearing from the network, from many people in the network. I've heard from few who don't want it, but I hear from many uh, who also are saying, when is it coming? Because they too want to move on and, and grow and, and, and be able to, to respond to the future need, to the current needs, which are very different than, than, than what they've been able to and also to the future needs. And I'm sure that many of them will testify after I get off and they will tell you their opinion. But I know that to be responsive and to live into the future, you've got to start sometime and this is the time to start. Well, we will continue to work on that, but I think it's also important um, for the DIFTA to make sure that we work with you, but to make sure that 10 million is added um, into the budget uh, for our senior center so that they can you know, be prepared to meet the new needs that they need to do. I mean, they're doing so much more than what they used to do before. So when we prepare for the senior center uh, to open, to have more uh, virtual program and make sure that there's sufficient um, services, we gotta make sure that at least that 10 million should be in there uh, in the adopted budget. So that, or even more, <laughs> but at least we, we gotta make sure that money is in there. Great. Did you get a promise from OMB? On that, we have we have on on from OMB what we have around that is that, and I, I I've said this before. I don't think anyone either in OMB or in this administration is is aware of that's a commitment. We we believe that that will be that will be realized, um, and it was just this this change in the financial situation that just set us all back. But this administration is committed to that 10 million um, being in the in the in the adopted budget as we are about looking in the future for RFPs and everything else. All right. So we'll, okay. keep, we will. And we'll keep this conversation going because it's really this is your last one and this is my last one. And we want to make sure that we have set a pathway for a future that honors the great work you've done for the last eight years. All right, so um, and yeah, with that, that, I will say goodbye. <laughs> oh, not yet. Uh, Council, not yet. Member oh. Rosenthal, <laughs> Council Member Rosenthal just joined okay. us. She's, she's chair of the subcommittee on capital projects, so. Okay, hi, how are you? So you can't leave yet. <laughs> All right, Council, good. Thank Council you. Council Member. There we go. It's so nice to see you, Commissioner. So nice to see you, Chair. I'm sure this was an exceptional hearing. I apologize for getting on late. I was, I had another Zoom, but um, I, Council Member Chin, I just wanted to pick up on on sort of something that was just agreed to and 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 clarify. Um, did I hear uh, the commissioner say that this administration is is committed to putting in the ten million dollars? 
I, I have, what I can tell you is that everyone is committed to, to working towards getting those $10 million in. Yes, uh, that is, that is what I know. You know, so there's, um, there's a critical, um, tiny little nuance that will reflect whether or not what you're saying is accurate. So okay. if the $10 million is put into the mayor's executive budget, then reflects commitment. If it doesn't get in until adoption, that means the city council is committed to getting it done, number one. And number two, it means that it's only in for one year. It doesn't get baselined. So I just want to make clear, I sort of, when I jumped in, I heard executive and adoption being used interchangeably. They're not interchangeable. It, it, on, in May, when the mayor comes out with the executive budget, the 10 million will either be in there or it won't. Full stop. If it's in there, I know I just said that, it reflects an actual commitment by this administration. If it is not in there and council member Chin has to, you know, do everything in her power to get that 10 million to be part of the negotiated conversation on what the final budget is for next year, Again, only one year, not baselined. And if I remember correctly, this is a, a change in the model. So there's no way it could just be done for one year. It must be baselined. Then it will be um, a, a very uh, uh, sad state of affairs. So I just wanted to make sure everyone understood the distinction between expense, uh, executive budget an adopted budget. Does that make sense, Commissioner? It does. Okay. Councilmember Rosendahl, last year it was in the exec budget and then it disappeared in the adopted budget. So because of what the because of the economic situation last year. Well, fair right? point. And, and now it's things, yeah. a couple of things dropped out between exec and, and adopted because the city wasn't able to go to the mm -hmm. market to get just basic funds to pay for basic services. I don't think that's gonna happen this no. year. I really don't. I think it's gonna be more of the exact is gonna reflect the true values of this administration. And it'll be, there will be funding for, um, you know, there'll either be funding or there won't. So, Anyway, thank you so much um, for that. And, and I mean, if there's one thing I can say, Commissioner, is God bless you for doing this work. It's so hard. And, you know, we know how important, everyone knows how important seniors are to you, to your agency. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure Chair Chin said it a bunch of times, but thank you for fighting the good fight. This has been an incredibly challenging time something that none of us have ever experienced before. So thank you for thank that. You. Thank you for that. It's my mitzvah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, uh, Council Member Rosenthal. I think we've also been joined by uh, Council Member Lewis. I saw her name. Are there other questions from uh, Council Members? Seeing that there are no other council members yeah. with their hand raised, I'm going to turn it to the chair for closing remarks. Um, okay. Commissioner, uh, thank you. And Mr. Mercado, thank you for being here today on this uh, preliminary budget hearing. And thank you for your partnership uh, for all these years. And we will build on a strong budget so that services for the older adults will have a good future. And uh, I look forward working with you on this budget to make sure that we get the resources that we need. So we'll continue our advocacy and confrontation until it's done. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone. Uh, so we're that. gonna...
go to public testimony, right? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and you will be called on after each panel has completed their testimony. For panelists who, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the surgeon to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. The first panelist will be Caitlin Andrews from Live On New York, Tyra Klein from United Neighborhood Houses, and Beth Finkel from AARP. I will now call on Caitlin Andrews to begin. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Councilmember Chen, for holding this hearing. My name is Caitlin Andrews, Director of Public Policy at Live On New York. Our members include more than 100 community-based nonprofits that provide core services that make New York a better place to age. For years, Live on New York has come to the city prior to budget adoption to highlight the importance of the aging services network. Even with a growing, increasingly diverse older adult population, the chronic underfunding of DIPTA has yet to be addressed. In fact, in recent years, providers have been promised millions of dollars in funding for senior centers that never came to be allocated, while also experiencing significant cuts and uncertainty to the indirect cost rate initiative. Amidst this, providers confronted a pandemic that put older adults at the greatest risk, not only to the virus, but to the negative health impacts of social isolation. In response, providers have changed their service models virtually overnight, shifting to reaching clients via phone or web, navigating new vaccine and food systems and more. The workers who provided these services are and will always remain essential. They're also predominantly women and people of color who are consistently being disinvested in by our city. But our budget does not reflect all the work that they're doing. Given this, we're advocating for the following. First, I echo the concerns that will, um, I'm sure, be raised by my colleagues and has been brought up regarding the indirect cost rate funding initiative for FY20 and FY21 and going forward. As a note, the cuts to this program have been particularly severe within DIFTA contracts. Like other providers, they received only 60% of their indirect cost rates in FY20. However, DIFTA providers only received this amount for seven months of their contracts with the other five months being neglected. I have one provider who for them, this means a cut of $350,000, $90,000 of which was due to that five month gap. They've also outlaid money in order to get the approved indirect cost rate and shifted mm -hmm. money out of their contracts into the indirect cost rate that has now been underfunded. This cut is significant and it impacts directly nonprofits ability to continue working and making sure that older adults remain fed, served and a part of our communities. We also request 16.6 .6 million to be added to the funding available for home delivered meals in order to increase capacity and meet new demand and increase the per meal rate that is still not at the national average despite our calling attention to this for years. Finally, the city must fully allocate the promised 10 million in funding for senior center staff and 5 million in funding for kitchen staff. These were funds promised and as highlighted by Council Member Chin and Council Member Rosenthal, they have yet to be included. This should not be a part of the budget negotiation and the budget dance. It must be an exec and then fulfilled That's throughout. Required. Finally, we would, we're would we looking for a restoration of the COLA, 3% across human service contracts and comprehensive emergency, emergency pay for human services workers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Caitlin. We will now hear from Katara. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Chen and Council members for convening today's hearing. My name is Tara Klein. I'm a Senior Policy Analyst with United Neighborhood Houses. UNH is a policy and social change organization representing 40 neighborhood settlement houses in New York City. 
Settlement houses have been on the front lines in meeting older adults' emergency needs during COVID-19, providing them with food, financial benefits, mental health supports, social activities to reduce isolation, and support in getting COVID tests and vaccinations. While we're glad that DIFTA's budget did not see cuts in FY22 prelim, we need to ensure that funding is increased in targeted ways to ensure older adults can continue to receive life-saving supports. My written testimony includes many more details, mm -hmm. and I just want to summarize the points here. First, we need to include the $10 million in model budget funding for senior centers. This is a broken promise from FY 2018. It was supposed to be there last year. This funding is truly mm -hmm. urgent this year. We also need to include the $5 million in additional funding for senior center kitchen staff. This is budgeted. Last year, it was also budgeted, but it was delayed at the last minute. We can't see that happen again. We do fear that these budget cuts may be indicative of a misperception in the city that senior centers have been closed during COVID, even though we know they've all pivoted to remote work and are doing really tremendous work to so serve older people. Next, we need to invest $16.6 .6 million in the Home Delivered Meals Program. This program is so successful and popular in providing nutritious meals to homebound seniors, but it's been significantly underfunded for years. There's been higher demand for this program during COVID mm -hmm. and we need to bring HDM up to the national average cost of a meal. And we need to stop the policy of switching older adults who qualify for home delivered meals into get food, which does not include social services and is inferior quality food. Next, we need to restore funding to the NORC program, including council funding for nursing services. Thank you for that support for the last two years for NORCs. We also need to look to enhance NORC staff salaries by at least $1.7 million. This will help ensure parity with other DIFTA funded contracts. Next, we need to restore and increase DOHMH's geriatric mental health initiative to $2.86 million. Uh, this is going to help expand services and meet older, ad older adults' mental health needs over the last year that have grown, including reported increases in feelings of depression, anxiety, and isolation. We need to restore and baseline all recurring one-year administration funds and council aging initiatives to at least their FY20 levels, reversing last year's cuts. That includes restoring the healthy aging initiative. And we need to fully fund the indirect cost rate initiative and mm -hmm. uh, support the human services sector through a 3% COLA. Uh, and finally, we uh, continue to call on the administration to delay the Older Adult Center RFP this is not the time. There's such a lack of certainty about the future. There's a need to focus on vaccination right now. And there are only I'm about inspired. three months left until new contracts are expected to begin at this point. This is not sufficient. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Happy to elaborate more or answer questions. Thank, thank, thank you, Tara. We will now hear from Beth. Thank you. Time starts now. Hi, first of all, Council Member Chen, I just when you say eight years, it just literally takes my breath away. You have um, left us such a wonderful legacy and uh, you've set the mark for future uh, chairs of aging and I love that you're gonna keep fighting for us this last year and have an even greater lasting legacy. So we, we thank you so much, we salute you. Um, I'm Beth Finkel, I'm the State Director for ARP New York. In New York City, we have over three quarters of a million members across New York State, over two and a half million members. And so we really feel like we need to weigh in on the budget for 2022. Uh, we've been hearing from everyone about the issues and we agree, so I'm just gonna hit on the strong points, but the most important point, which I know People have said, I've got to say it again, less than half of 1% of New York City's budget is allocated for older adults, and that is unconscionable. We have to start right from there at the get-go. It is the biggest number of growth of any demographic group, and yet the percentage of the budget never improves. It's kind of like a total disregard, yep. and we all need to wake up or we're going to end up with a lot of older adults who are in really very, very poor condition and are going to be uh, more of a drain on all of our um, institutions, which we really can't have. We all know that the onset of COVID-19 has made everything worse. I'm not gonna go over that. We know how older adults have in particularly been affected. And we also know the valiant efforts of social service networks and the senior service providers that many of our 
uh, those colleagues are on this call with me today. So I'm going to hit the, the high points here. First of all, we need to invest 16.6 .6 million in additional funding for home delivered meals. Second, we we need to call on the city to allocate that $10 million in funding for senior centers, and it must be baseline. I thought Council Members Rosenthal's point about the executive budget is so key to this. We also need $5 million in funding senior center kitchen staff in the FY22. Third, we call upon the city to expand funding for senior centers and other DIFTA providers to improve with their technology infrastructure. I think we heard that again mm -hmm. and again. Fourth, we recommend that the city continue to preserve discretionary and one-time executive funding in FY22. And last, we want to really voice ARP's concern about the chronic underfunding of human service contracts with not-for-profit providers, especially in regard to providers of aging-related services. The 3% indirect cost rate funding initiative really is so important to allow the COLA for employees uh, not to not to expire and to renew it for 2021. Sorry, so, sorry. Okay, so we believe these investments in the FY22 budget will help New York City's 50 plus residents recover from the current crisis and improve their livelihoods as well as their well being and ensure that the city's network of aging related nonprofits and senior providers have the financial stability to continue to bear out this storm and to arise from it stronger and even more productive than they already have been. And I, I thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you to that, that panel. This is a reminder to all of the council members that if you would like, get, like to ask questions of this panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Thank you. So I will now be calling on Seeing that no council members have their hand raised, I will now call on the next um, group of panelists. Molly Krakowski from JASA, Melissa Skultz from SAGE, and Ravi Reddy from the Asian American Senior Community. We will, we will begin with Molly. Time starts now. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Chair Chin and members of the Aging Committee for the opportunity to testify today. Um, JASA is a nonprofit organization serving over 40,000 older New Yorkers. Um, we are very appreciative of the council and especially Council Member Chin for your leadership of the Aging Committee and your continued support of aging services and the needs of the human services sector. Your leadership in budget negotiations last year and your continued focus on the needs of older New Yorkers this year have been critical in the city's response to COVID-19 and, and keeping the spotlight on older New Yorkers. JASA's budget requests and priorities for FY22 are tied to fair funding of social service contracts in New York City. We're looking to the city to fully fund New York City contracts and to honor the indirect rates that were approved prior to the FY21 budget and to keep hold the critical New York City Council initiatives supporting senior services, such as the NORC initiative, Support Our Seniors, Dove, Digital Inclusion, and Sukasa, and, and the executive funding that has replaced some of those um, NORC, NORC funding that were previously funded exclusively by the City Council. Um, over the course of the past year, uh, JASA did a full pivot We've been providing thousands of telephone calls and remote services and classes and coordinating all sorts of um, programs um, and, and peer support groups remotely um, and online. Our home care workers, our home delivered meal staff continued providing daily deliveries. Uh, our community guardian and adult protective service staff continued meeting with clients. And just to give you a sense, APS um, staff managed 4,400 referrals and conducted 9,700 face-to-face visits between March and January. Um, so those people have continued throughout being a face in the community. Um, I, we are very closely working with the city and with DIFTA in all vaccination efforts, including in our section 202 HUD housing, where we've vaccinated over a thousand of our 2,200 tenants in conjunction with CVS clinics. 
Uh, in FY22 and in planning for the future, we need to think about services in terms of broader delivery strategies. The city has to ensure that older, adult, older adults have the technology to connect to services and the city council funds can't be used for devices. The city has to make those devices available and the, and the supports for those services. Beyond technology, I wanna focus on indirect costs. JASA had been approved for the new indirect rate like other service providers. We lost nearly $500,000 in FY20. We still don't know three quarters of the way through this year what our indirect rate is for the current year. We need the indirect rate put in place. Just to give you a sense, our accounting department has been submitting and resubmitting numerous budget modifications throughout the year. Time the HR department has been doing PPE and staff related changes every time there's a change in what is required and what the um, what we need to do with staff and how they can take time off and what to do about staff that's been exposed. It's the amount of IT support, and this is all indirect, the amount of IT support to manage a fully remote hundreds of, wor hundreds of workers um, and programming is tremendous. And so um, I know we're out of time, but I really wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify um, and to put that indirect front and center as a commitment that the city made um, as we move into the um, FY22 negotiations. And, and I hope it will be in the executive budget um, to fix the, the current situation because it's, a, it's a, a real need. Thank you so much. And thank you for all these years of sharing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Molly. Next, we will be hearing from Melissa Sklars. Time starts now. Thank you. Sklars, Sklars. Uh, so um, uh, my name is Melissa Sklars. I am um, with SAGE, the oldest and largest uh, organization to improve the lives of LGBT elders. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Margaret Chin. You are a fierce warrior for us all. Thank you, Beth Finkel. A half of 1% funding, um, awful. Um, hopefully that'll improve. LGBT elders are more invisible. They're more disconnected. Thin support networks, less family support. Quiet. More likely to live alone, half as likely to be partnered, four times less likely to have children to support them as they age. LGBT elders in New York depend upon community service providers such as SAGE. Uh, our community has more poverty, more health issues, um, more bad health. COVID has exasperated all this. It has, we are, we have lost our people in our constituency. Um, what we have done with SAGE is we have created LGBT friendly, affordable senior housing. We have done this at Stonewall House in Fort Greene in Brooklyn. We have done this in Cretona Pride House in East Tremont in the Bronx, 145 units in Brooklyn, 83 units in the Bronx. Both are anchored by SAGE centers. In Brooklyn, it's 6,800 square feet. In the Bronx, it'll be over 10,000 square feet. We have state-of-the-art services, quality programming. We have personnel on the ground available, not only to residents, but for all elders in the neighborhood. Both of these um, will join our network of six different um, SAGE centers throughout the city. They will be a beacon. Uh, COVID has forced us to bring all of our programming online. Uh, we have, in spite of COVID, created new programs such as Sage Sense to help elders with their finances and Sage Connect to fight isolation and connect them with trained volunteers. Uh, we've even helped with uh, vaccine appointments, something that was unimaginable as recently as two years ago. I'm here today to ask the council in their endless support of us for a restoration of our funding, our Sage Centers, um, especially the new ones in, in Brooklyn and, and the Bronx uh, will be everything uh, that all of our other centers have been. They will provide people, community, places to go, support, um, and they will grow and it'll be like a, a pebble in a pond. It'll ripple out uh, throughout the rest of the neighborhood and, um, and support this. So the council has been great. I, I look forward. You have all my written information. I don't have to go into the numbers now. Um, and thank you again, Margaret Chen. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, we will hear from Ravi Reddy. Time starts now. Hi, I want to thank this committee for holding this hearing and giving the Asian American Federation the opportunity to testify on the needs of our senior community and our senior service providers. Thank you so much, Chair Chen, for your years of constant advocacy and vocal support for our community. It's truly appreciated. I'm Ravi Reddy, the Associate Director of Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. If anything, this fiscal year's budget will need to support a city that is at once in the grips of a pandemic and simultaneously recovering from it. And the dollars should first flow to the communities and the populations most vulnerable and most impacted in both. That's why we're here today. We're here because 13% of the city's senior population are now Asian. Among our seniors, one in four Asian New Yorkers live in poverty and 72% of Asian seniors have limited English proficiency and comprise more than two thirds of the senior population in many neighborhoods across Brooklyn and Queens. Additionally, one in four LEPC Asian seniors in the city do not have access to the internet at home. This budget must address the importance of increasing direct service capacity in our community during the pandemic. We are seeing challenges because of the sheer number of languages spoken in our homes and the accompanying lack of accessibility to vital information. Considering the high poverty and LEP rates among our seniors, having access to services is extremely difficult and compounds the existing isolation that many are already struggling with. Asian seniors, many of whom are immigrants, have a greater need for access to these programs in part due to the continued after effects of the previous administration's public charge assault. In addition, the city must fund an emergency network of linguistically and culturally competent food service programs and connect Asian seniors to these alternative food benefits in order to begin to address the harm inflicted on this population by the loss of access to traditional government assistance programs and shortcomings in culturally competent city services. And while Asian New Yorkers comprise at least 10% of the population in more than half of the city districts, while the other half have some of the fastest growing Asian populations, from fiscal year 2002 to 2014, the Asian American community received a mere 1.4% of the total dollar value of New York City's social service contracts, a reflection of a broader long-term trend. But our senior service member agencies are working beyond capacity in support of our elders, and they're creating and innovating processes to make sure our seniors are getting the services they need as efficiently and safely as possible. One example is using meal delivery service to conduct mental health wellness checks with trained volunteers in Queens or sourcing culturally competent food from farmers growing Asian vegetables in Brooklyn. From May to November alone, AAF helped six senior serving organizations to serve almost 3,000 seniors with nearly 20,000 food services and 8,500 assurance calls. Nevertheless, as City Council works on this year's budget, council members must keep in mind the persistent inequities in city contracting practices and the systemic barriers facing our community based organizations seeking the dollars the council is allocating for this year. Contracting processes must prioritize the CBOs that have the expertise needed to make the most of every dollar in our communities by giving greater weight to organizations with demonstrated track records of serving low-income, underserved immigrant communities with linguistic and cultural competency. Our CBOs are leading by example in the provision of direct services from providing wraparound services that include mental wellness checks to allying with food suppliers that provide culturally competent food. With the looming budget cuts, our advocacy efforts and budget ask is that our nonprofits be provided with enough resources to protect essential services to support our elders. We understand the city is in dire financial straits, but CBOs have led by example in how to spend city dollars effectively. And this moment presents an opportunity for this city council to show that New York City can still lead by example in protecting its most vulnerable. We are the Asian American Federation. Thank you for allowing us to testify and look forward to working with all of you to make sure our city your communities get the support they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to this panel. Seeing that no council members have their hands raised. Okay. Chair Chen. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the, the last two panel, um, the advocacy organization and the service provider for all your great work, especially during the pandemic in serving our seniors and the most vulnerable seniors. And I look forward to working with you to make sure that we get a strong budget this year, that we can increase more. Uh, hey, get us to 1% at least, right? To start off with. Uh, so we gotta continue to advocate. I urge all of you uh, to also reach out uh, to other council member, council members uh, district that you serve, 
to help us with this uh, advocacy because we can't do it just by ourselves. We need, I need all my colleagues on board, colleagues on the budget negotiation team and you know, colleagues across from all districts. So get your members uh, to help us and um, to get the support. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Seeing that no other council members um, have the hand raised to ask questions, I will now call on our next panel. The next panel will, panel will be Rhonda Soberman from the Visiting Nurse Services of New York, Rachel Shero from City Mills on Wheels, and Kimberly George from Project Guardianship. We will first begin with Rhonda Soberman. Time starts now. Rhonda, muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good morning, Chair Chin and members of the City Council. My name is Rhonda Soberman. I'm from the Visiting Nurse Service of New York and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I want to share the importance of the work VNSMY is doing with our naturally occurring retirement community program partners in 30 NORC programs covering 22 New York City Council districts, as well as our work as at the VNSMY sponsored Chinatown Neighborhood NORC. In order to continue this important work, the Visiting Nurse Service of New York and our NORC partners are asking the New York City Council to reallocate the 1.3 million in funding for all NORC nursing services. VNSMY touches the lives of more than 44,000 patients and health plan members each day through a wide range of programs in the, at, all at home for people in their homes. Um, in our 125 year history, we've been there to support communities in some of the biggest public health and natural emergencies and COVID-19 hasn't been any different. Since March, 2020, we've cared for more than 5,000 COVID positive New Yorkers in their home. The world has dramatically changed and the services delivered by our Newark nurses have become even more critical for seniors living in Newark locations today. By the end of the fiscal year, we'll, we will have provided more than 12,000 hours of Newark nursing services. The council's funding enabled our Newark nurses to assist seniors throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Our goal was to help seniors, especially those health conditions, by communicating the most updated information to them and helping them to avoid unnecessary emergency room visits and hospitalizations, which would have put them at greater risk. The pandemic has made it abundantly clear more seniors with greater health care needs will get their care in their homes instead of in health care facilities. And Newark nurses continue to support uh, these seniors to get the right care when and where they need it. When doctors and other healthcare provider offices were closed or operating under reduced hours, our nurses stepped in to provide important guidance and support. We also support our NORC partners request for 1.7 million in funding to address the NORC salary parity for the DIPTA funded NORCs. In summary, we urge the city council to renew the 1.3 million in funding for NORC nursing services and provide salary parity for NORC social service providers so that we can continue to support the critically important and very successful NORC program. We look forward to working with the council to ensure that our seniors have the appropriate nursing and social services they deserve. Obviously, my remarks were much reduced. Uh, we will be sending you, you know, more detailed information in our written communications. And I wanna thank you, Chair Chin, for your leadership over these years. It's been a pleasure. And we look forward to fighting with you to get whatever you need so we can help our seniors. Thanks again. Thank you, Rhonda. Next, we will be hearing from Rachel Shero. Time starts now. Uh, hi, just to um, pile on what everybody else has been saying, um, I would like to begin by thanking you, um, Chair Chin, um, for your compassionate dedication and, and advocacy throughout the years um, and for dignity and greater support of senior services and for City Meals on Wheels. We certainly appreciate that. And again, a shout out to Beth's statistics, which I know, but when I hear it over and over, it's just mind blowing, especially, you know, uh, following my, my colleagues, what they've all talked about. This is the fastest growing population 
I, I can't say it enough. And we also, I just wanna talk about a couple of things. I wanna begin by reflecting on the anniversary of the pandemic and describe what we did at City Meals. Uh, we were prepared and ready. We delivered our first emergency meals on March 5th, at least a week before the city shut down because we were concerned something might happen, um, which would necessitate having food on hand for our most vulnerable older adults. That's what we do and what we wanna be able to continue to do now and in the future, regardless of the emergency or the crisis. I also wanna state the fact that City Meals, along with our partners and advocates, many of whom have been in this hearing all day, have been consistently lobbying for the support of aging services, which are continually underfunded and undersupported despite the growing population. Um, we really wanna to um, emphasize how important home delivered meals are throughout the, the pandemic, the services remain seamless, even when the city shut down um, services. And as a sector, aging providers have always known how critical our services are, but not, so, not more so than in the current environment. When Meals on Meals staff are literally essential workers, making sure their recipients don't go without food or a friendly face, risking their own lives to maintain a lifeline for our elderly neighbors. Uh, most crucial is the situation we currently obviously find our vulnerable and hungry older adult neighbors in. We know that our population is needy and hungry throughout the year, pre-COVID, pre during COVID, and it will continue. Home delivered meals is so essential in ensuring at least one nutritious meal a day is available to consume. Reliance on home delivered meals, as everyone else has talked about, has only increased since the pandemic and reassured has reassured many new recipients that they're not forgotten. We just really want to um, underscore how much um, DIFTA needs more support in, in home delivered meals and obviously when senior centers reopen. We're requesting $500,000 for emergency supplemental meals for FY22 to ensure that homebound older adults have enough food on hand in case of a disruption in service. We know how to do this. We've been doing it all year and we've been doing it for decades. Um, we also want to um, support the $25 million in reauthorized emergency meals funding of which we were lucky enough to get some of it in order to continue the work we do with a population not served by any other emergency feeding group. And as we move through our incredible 40th year, we thank you as our partners. And I did forget to say my name, it's Rachel Sherrill and I'm the Associate Executive Director at City Meals. And I thank you very much for this opportunity. And we will be out there to help you uh, no matter what you need from us. Thank you, thank you, Rachel. We will now hear from Kimberly George. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Kimberly George, the president of Project Guardianship. We were founded by the Vera Institute of Justice 16 years ago. Our agency serves as the legal guardian for older adults and individuals living with disabilities and cognitive disorders, such as Alzheimer's. The people we serve need help making decisions and have no family near friends to help them. Most are older adults, 76% are 61 or older, and most are low income and living below the poverty line. Since COVID hit a year ago, we have continued to be on the front lines working to keep our clients who are very high risk for serious illness and death from COVID safe and not isolated. We make sure that clients have all the um, vital basics, food, money, medicine, supplies, housing security, home health care, and medical and mental health care. For clients in nursing homes, we oversee their care, medical interventions and surgeries, and we ensure that end of life decisions are made in line with their wishes. Unfortunately, we lost 29 clients to COVID. All but three were living in nursing homes. At Project Guardianship, every client has a dedicated team of an attorney, a case manager, a finance manager, property manager, and benefit its administrator who work together to ensure the clients live safely and with the greatest quality of life. We serve clients in all five boroughs of New York City and are available to them 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. There is great need for, the, for Project Guardianship to serve this population. Courts have difficulty finding private guardians willing to serve low-income clients who have little or no ability to pay for the guardianship. This is especially true for the court's hardest to serve cases with complicated issues that require a great deal of time and expertise, um, such as clients with multiple health challenges, along with issues of elder abuse, housing insecurity, eviction proceedings, deed thefts, foreclosures, and difficult family dynamics. Project Guardianship accepts cases regardless of the ability to pay or the complexity of the case. Protecting and caring for people 
people in need of protective arrangements needs to be a top priority. Our request for continued funding from the New York City Council for fiscal year 2020, both from Support Our Seniors and the Speakers Initiative, will be used to maintain and hopefully increase our services. Unfortunately, we lost 30% of our City Council funding um, because of COVID's ramifications on the budget in 2021. Um, I want to thank the City Council for its support over the years and for being a champion for guardianship through the funding it allocates to Project Guardianship. City Council support is critical for us because other funding sources for this service are scarce. The guardianship system relies on the person under guardianship having assets to pay for their guardian. The publicly funded guardian programs in New York City are only accessible for people in adult protective services system. So people without resources resources for whom hospitals, nursing homes, neighbors um, who make the petition, they have no public guardian option. We therefore are requesting that our funding be restored, restored to fiscal year 2020 levels. Funding will I'm provide required. benefits to the community because we specialize in helping clients remain in their home or return home from a nursing home. Nearly 60% of our clients live in their own homes. Thank you to the city council members, um, Chair Chin, um, and the committee for inviting me to testify today. Thank you. Seeing that no council members have their hand raised, I will now turn it to our next. Chair oh, Chin. Oh, I just wanted to really thank the panel, um, this panel. Um, I know, you know, visiting their service, the great work that you do, um, the neighborhood knock in my district and the nursing services. The nursing services should be paid by the state, <laughs> for the state, you know, for their norm. Why are we paying for it? Um, I think a lot of it is really advocating and make sure that the state uh, give us the, the fair amount of money that we deserve. Uh, um, and City Meals, thank you for your service during the COVID. I know that you're also helping, you know, with the distributing vaccine um, information, I mean, this is the infrastructure that we have already. And that's why we kept advocating with the city, utilize our senior service providers uh, to get information out to seniors uh, on the pandemic, on how to get a vaccine. Infrastructure is there. They gotta just provide the resources and the support. So thank you to this panel uh, for your hard work. And uh, we're gonna work together to make sure that we have a strong budget. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on the next panel, next and final panel, Olivia Cawthorn from the Queens Botanical Garden, Dr. Cynthia Mayer from the Visiting Neighbors Inc., Bing G from Village View North, Wesley Davis from New York Roadrunners, and Wendell Walters from the Osborne Association. We will first begin with Olivia. Olivia? Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair Chin and members of the committee for welcoming me here to speak today. My name is Olivia Cothran. I am the Director of Development at Queens Botanical Garden, the place where people, plants, and cultures meet. If you don't know us, we're a 39-acre botanical garden and cultural institution uh, right on Main Street in Flushing, Queens. And I'm here today to share a little bit about what we've been doing to serve our seniors throughout COVID and really just to show support to your work and to all the other panelists that we've heard from so far. So QBG and our fellow cultural institutions have contributed to public life, public health and public service for all New Yorkers uh, in many different ways throughout COVID. So at Queens Botanical Garden, we have been doing things like uh, donating food grown on our farm to New Yorkers in need. We've been hosting flu shot events. We've been doing virtual programming. But really the way that we have served our senior community throughout COVID is by being this open space for seniors to come and to gather in a socially distanced safe way with others uh, throughout the pandemic. And especially since we reopen on July 21st and have been open the whole time since then. So as an outdoor cultural institution, we really are one of the few places where seniors have been able to come, see friends, take a walk, and just feel like they're in a safe, beautiful outdoor space um, over the last few months. 
And every single day we have uh, Tai Chi at the garden. I know that was spoken about earlier. So we have groups of um, Tai Chi uh, practitioners who come to the garden. And you know, we also have seniors every day, day in and day out, just coming to take a walk with a friend, just admiring the beauty of the garden and the safe oasis that it provides for the community of Flushing and Queens and really all New Yorkers. Nearly 50% of our membership is at the senior level. So we, we really are a critical resource for seniors, especially in our neighborhood who can walk to the garden. We're right on, on Main Street and um, really a place to combat that social isolation that we've heard spoken about as well that many seniors are experiencing um, throughout this year now more than ever. We also offer extensive volunteer opportunities for seniors. One of our most longstanding volunteer partners is the Retired and Senior Volunteer Program, RSVP, through the Community Service Society of New York. We usually have 25 seniors volunteering through that program every year. We've still had one active senior through that program over the past year. We have others who are waiting to be vaccinated and then they've expressed that they want to come back to the garden, contribute their time, um, give back to the garden. And really, so we just wanted to share um, how much our seniors mean to the garden and really just show support for your work and know that culture is here for as well. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. We'll now hear from Dr. Cynthia Mayer. Time starts now. Dr. Dr. Cynthia, we we cannot can you uh, we cannot hear. Her. Okay, yes, now you get. Okay, got it. <laughs> Good. Uh, the park is gorgeous, by the way. Uh, my name is Cynthia Maurer uh, with Visiting Neighbors, and I want to thank Margaret Chen and the council for being tremendous um, supporters of us. First of all, I want to let you know that because of your support, we were still able to be here. We were on the front lines from the beginning of this pandemic. We were go, 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 go. Our volunteers were active and connected to the seniors. We worked with 1,400 seniors, and many of them weren't our clients. We serve about 1,000 people. We took on other pe new people through this pandemic that needed help. Seniors were frightened. They were nervous. It's unbelievable how much has happened. It's been basically a whirlwind. But because of the support, we were able to provide telephone reassurance and not just a check-in call. We had those. Are you OK? Is everything all right? But tremendous amount of counseling and support. People were depressed. People were upset. People didn't have accurate information. So we were getting that information to them. And we were assigning volunteers based on their skill set to the seniors. We took seniors on therapeutic walks because they were getting stir crazy. We did a lot of protection in terms of teaching them about using PPE um, and getting them the supplies in the first place. Volunteers stood on food pantry lines. They went and worked with local um, restaurants who had extra food and picked up supplies and gave them to seniors. The volunteers did things far beyond that we normally would do. Like the little engine we could that could, we got up at, over every single hill. But we did it because we had the financial fuel that the council and of course that senior initiative enhancement uh, that Margaret Chin helped us get enabled us to be here for our people. Our clients are amongst the oldest old, 85 plus. We have 75% are over 80, 33% are over 90, 90% live alone, 97% are in limited fixed incomes. Most of our seniors are not in a position to have family or friends around. 90% um, of them are isolated and alone. And we were a lifeline, a connection, family. Volunteers really were the true testament of how fabulous New York can be and how incredibly resilient. But again, we weren't, wouldn't have been able to be here without that support. So first of all, first and foremost, thank you for enabling us to continue to be here in our 49th year. I keep saying 48 because I can't believe how much has happened. It's sort of this year is a tremendous blur. Um, but we provided friendly visiting. We did it in very clever, unique ways, mailings cheer up mailings, sympathy cards, a lot of grief counseling and support because these seniors and volunteers needed it. We had a volunteer who 
basically was so freaked out. She opened our door one day, screamed out and then left. And we were like, what was that? We ran after her with bar chocolate, threw her bar of chocolate from six distance, six foot distance. And she said, thank you. She just needed to be able to vent. Being there for people is very important. I'd like to end on one quote. We asked seniors for advice. We wanted to engage them in a meaningful activity. And we've been collecting advice from seniors. And one 101 year old said, take good care of yourself. You never know how long you'd be on this planet. I would have taken better care of myself had I known I'd lived this long. Our eldest client was 107. She managed to get through the pandemic. At 107 in December, she passed in her own home, in her own bed. We should all be so lucky. So thank you for your support. Please continue to do so. We need it. We need you and our seniors need us. Thank you. We will now be hearing from Bing G. Time starts now. Okay, no me to. It's so hard to follow that. Thank you, Dr. Cynthia. It's such a lovely story. Um, good afternoon, Chair Ching and members of the City Council. Uh, thank you, Chair Ching, for your years of dedication to the older adults community and your leadership. There are so many great, great stories out there. Um, my name is Bing. Uh, I am the program director of the Village View Nork and Wellness Together program at University Settlement. For 135 years, University Settlement has provided holistic community programming for families, neighbors across Manhattan and Brooklyn. The city must increase mental health funding so we can expand our mental health programming so more older adults can access it. Older adults not, are not a monolith and DIFTA needs more funding and more flexibility for organizations to come up with their own program models. Right now, because DIFTA places clinicians in senior centers in the mental health initiative, uh, only seniors who have access to senior centers will get the actual services. And citywide, only a small number of eligible older adults actually go to senior centers. With more funding, we could expand the programming to reach those older adults who do not come to senior centers, who go to gardens. And importantly, we must expand funding to reach homebound older adults. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has meant a full year of isolation for elders. And we move closer, as we move closer to controlling the physical dangers of the virus, the mental and emotional results of this past difficult year will continue. Over five years ago, University Solomon developed our own mental health for older adults initiative that provides a continuum of critical mental health care embedded within our existing programs. Our initiative has a team of four monolingual uh, clinicians with cross-cultural backgrounds and the expertise, which helps us ensure older adults are more comfortable with mental health programming, making our programming more effective. And with our experience, we believe contacts should be, contracts should be allowed to prefer providers more flexibility. For example, currently, DIFTA places clinicians at senior centers, which is understandably helpful for providers without mental health resources. But at, as University Settlement has our own mental health consultation center with trained clinicians and a physician on staff, we believe leaning our own existing staff and resources would only further strengthen our program. Indeed, our smooth in settlement house referral system has enhanced our ability to provide additional or continual mental health support for many older adult participants. Additionally, we are concerned that DIFTA is the city agency with the smallest amount of funding, even as the older adult population is increasing across the city. Over the next years, we hope that the city will increase DIFTA's budget to serve the growing population, the close collaboration of, and, the, I'm and lastly, we, we thank you. We echo nonprofits in calling out the city to fulfill its indirect rate commitment. Uh, thank you for your time. You'll find more details in my written testimony. Thank you, Bing. Next, we will be hearing from Leslie Davis. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, first, I want to say good afternoon to Chair Shin, um, other uh, city council members, and my peers. My name is Wesley Davis. And I am the um, assistant manager for the New York Roadrunner Striders program. Uh, New York Roadrunner Striders program is a senior walking fitness program um, at New York Roadrunners. 
New York Road Runners aims to help and inspire people through running. To extend that mission, NYR Striders offers free coast-led fitness sessions geared towards improving attitudes towards fit exercise by making it more accessible for older adults. Our program also promotes cultivation of increased social connections through a variety of classes, events, and resources. By incorporating strength and flexibility exercises and fitness activities in our walking and running and exercise sessions, our program is inclusive and can help improve the quality of everyone through its virtual and in-person offerings. Over the last 10 years, NYR Striders has demonstrated that anyone, no matter their age or ability, can be active. In response to the pandemic and keeping the safety of our community as our top priority, NYR Striders launched our new free online resource, NYR Striders at Home. The virtual platform provides physical literacy-based activities that are safe to practice under space constraints and social distancing guidelines. NYR Striders at Home includes live stream fitness classes, call-in fitness classes, on-demand videos, and printed material. Through these resources, we are able to ensure that our participants in underrepresented communities needing this resource beyond our in-person audience are able to access it without barriers. NYR respectfully asks the New York City Council to consider our request to support our free citywide virtual fitness and social connection program for New York City seniors. Despite the dire need for health-based services for seniors during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Council's Healthy Aging Initiative was cut in FY21 effectively defunded NYR's work with seniors from this, the city budget, which was supported under the initiative for many years. With our FY22 request, we are hoping to restore our funding so our effective Striders program could continue to be offered free virtually and digitally and our in-person pending guide, guidance from, from city, state, and DIFTA um, officials in the coming budget year. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, NYR are believes more than ever in the power of our organization to help New York City seniors and older adult population, our experts, inclusive closers, and our key partners with city agencies and our unique ability to produce both in-person and virtual resources that are effective and engaging for people of all ages to stay healthy, active, and socially engaged during this difficult time. Thank you again for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Wesley. Now we will be hearing from Wendell Waters. Time starts now. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Wendell Waters. I'm a senior and the senior policy associate in the Center for Justice Across Generations at the Osborne Association. Osborne is a criminal justice organization that provides a wide range of diversion and reentry programs at sites in the Bronx, uh, Brooklyn Hall and Buffalo, uh, Newburgh, uh, as well as uh, services in uh, 32 New York State prisons and six uh, New York City jails, including Rikers, of course. My testimony focuses on older adults returning uh, from incarceration. Today, there are more than 8,000 people over age 50 in New York State prisons. They represent 25% of our state's prison population, and that number will probably be growing in the coming years. At the time of our latest report from the state, uh, there were more than 1,000 men and women uh, aged 50 and over who leave state prison and return to New York City each year. Uh, I want to thank the City Council, of course, and the Committee on Aging and the Chair and her uh, leadership, uh, which has been so significant over the past uh, eight years, and particularly like to thank uh, Council Member Daniel uh, Drum. Uh, I know he's not part of the uh, committee, uh, but want to thank him for his leadership in passing the Compassionate Assistance for Returning uh, Elders Act, or we call the CARE Act, uh, which established a temporary interagency uh, task force that included DIFTA uh, to examine the needs of older adults uh, post-incarceration. Although the task force has not been able to meet consistently uh, over the past year due to the COVID crisis, headway is now being made to ensure uh, to, to issue, uh, not being made to uh, ensure elder reentry recommendations around housing, healthcare, and the expansion of existing services uh, in the coming in the coming months. Osborne is seeking city council funding in the amount of $150,000 for elder reentry initiative, or ERI. ERI provides case management and support for elders returning to New York City from city jails and state prisons. Uh, since fiscal year 2017, ERI has helped more than 400 elders with transition planning, 
referrals to health services, housing, peer mentoring, social isolation support, and a wide range of other support in the community while maintaining a recidivism rate uh, for those released from prison of less than 2%. The program works to improve community receptivity and access to responsive geriatric services for our elders. We also partner with senior centers, uh, hopefully they'll reopen soon, uh, to uh, increase referrals, uh, cross-trained service providers in healthy aging and corrections to ensure city agencies uh, and providers are better able to address these co-occurring challenges. A more detailed description of the program will be submitted uh, for the record. Osborne is also developing our own model of reentry housing for returning elders. We've, we've begun construction on the Fulton Reentry Center, a former work release building uh, turned community in the Bronx that will have 135 transitional beds and programs for the formerly uh, incarcerated. Uh, construction should be completed uh, next year. We hope that the council will favorably consider our request for funding. Our work in this field has been proven to be successful. More and more individuals of advanced age are coming home to New York City after being away for many years. They have unique challenges that must be met and Osborne is here to help them. Thank you so much for the chance to talk to you uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Wendell. Chair Chen, do you have any remarks? Yes, I really wanted to thank this, this panel. Um, it's always, I, I'm very happy to see Cynthia. Um, we've gone a long way um, in supporting visiting neighbors. And I still don't understand why uh, DIFTA does not have a contract with you uh, to do the service when they're starting all these program about volunteers and visiting when you have the expertise for the past 49 years. Uh, and I'm just uh, grateful to our, uh, all the volunteers that you've trained and uh, taking care of our most vulnerable senior. And those stories are really great. And we will continue to support you um, in the city council. And the, um, I forgot your name, but that, um, uh, Bing, yeah, from uh, University Settlement. Well, that Village View North is a city council, uh, North. <laughs> the city council supported it. I think uh, council member Rivera because the Village uh, View is in her district. And that is from city council discretionary funding, which is not baseline. And that's why we need to advocate for more baseline funding for North because we should be starting more Norths. And we started the initiative and hopefully the administration will learn from us and provide more funding to develop more North because that's a direct way of providing services directly uh, to our seniors. And I do want to thank all the you know, advocates who came to testify today for your service, for your great work, especially during this pandemic. I mean, Queens Botanical Garden, I wish you were in every uh, borough but you're only in Queens and Brooklyn. Uh, but I know that the residents in, in Queens, especially in council members' Coos district, they enjoy us so much uh, with meeting their friends and Thai cheese and everything. Um, so we will continue to support all these important programs. And I know about the, uh, the initiative that the Osborne Association you were talking about and a strong support from uh, council member Drum and he's our finance chair. So I'm sure you can count on his support. And I really wanna urge everyone uh, who participated uh, in this hearing today and really get the message out uh, to your member, to your supporter, that the advocacy just started um, for this year's budget. And we need to hear your voices and the council member needs to hear your voices. Uh, so let's work together to make sure that we have a strong um, ethical, you know, equitable budget that really service the growing population of our seniors, of our older adults in, uh, in the city. So um, I look forward to working with you, all of you and really appreciate uh, all your support and, and coming to the hearing today. Thank and you. I also wanted to thank uh, all the committee staff, uh, finance staff to work on preparing for this hearing and all the sergeant and all that help us run the, the the hearing smoothly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Before we um, pass it on to Chair for our final closing remarks, um, I just want to make sure that we 
we, we got everyone who registered to testify. So if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order in which your hand is raised. Seeing none, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I will now turn it back to Chair Chen for some closing remarks. <laughs> I think I already did my closing earlier. And so once again, thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today at, the, uh, at our budget hearing for the uh, Department for the Aging. And we look forward to working with all of you to make sure that we have a strong equitable budget for our older adults in your city. So thank you again and have a wonderful day. The hearing is adjourned.